Hi everybody. In this video I'd like to talk about acid semantics, base semantics, and start talking about NoSQL. When we're using our laptops, we have this illusion that whatever programs we're running are running continually on their own dedicated CPU. So if we're watching a video while having a browser window open with Facebook or whatever we have open while working on some coding example with some of our favorite editor or working on a paper with Microsoft Word, we're under the illusion that all these things are working at once, that the video is playing continually on a core, Microsoft Word's on a core, the browser's running on a core, and whatever else we're doing, we have an SSH window open, whatever, all this stuff is running continually. When in fact, it's, it is, it's just an illusion. What's happening is that that video plays and then gets interrupted and some other program goes on that processing core and that gets interrupted and the video re program resumes. So these programs are constantly being interrupted and replaced on running on the core. So they're constantly running, getting interrupted, placing on a queue to a wait queue, a ready queue and being put back and so on. So I have a four core ma machine here. I have this few generation old 2.6 gigahertz Intel Core i7, so four cores. And I have an overabundance of things running. I have like 2,000 threads running here. So I have this video QuickTime player. It's recording this video. I have this ArtRage demo program running, which allows me to write this stuff on the screen here. Chrome running. I have a virtual machine running. So lots and lots of stuff that are constantly getting interrupted on the processor, some other thing running on that processor, and then put back on the processor. Now the problem is when we have like 26 threads here running on the QuickTime player is that if they share memory, and most programs that have multiple threads share memory, it's really tricky, as you probably learned in other programming classes, to write that code. And the problem is this. Let me bring that up. So here I'm on my virtual machine. And um, let's just take a look. I think I called it that. So here I have a very simple program. And when we look at this code, it looks like, well, this gets executed all at once. This x equals x plus 500,000. So that looks like something atomically. Either it's, it's going to start it and not get interrupted until we get to the next line. Maybe there'll be some interruption in our program. And let's take a look at that in more detail. So I'm going to compile this program. And now I'm going to go into the debugger. And now I'm going to disassemble that uh, procedure, the main procedure. And here you see that, you, you know, one simple instruction, this x equals whatever it is, 50 million, whoops, I screwed up there, is um, X is actually multiple instructions. And let me see, I unfortunately. And here this X equals X plus 500,000 is actually four instructions. So this code could get interrupted anytime. So we can get X equals X here. So it looks up what X is, suppose X was whatever, five, just to make life easy rather than all those zeros. So it looks that up, x equals 5. We instantiate that, and then we get interrupted before we add it to it. So we're, it's every, what looks like atomic gets interrupted. And we, what we want to do in writing these threaded applications, as you probably already have learned and what you'll learn more in operating systems class, is we want to be able to have a block of code that runs what's called atomically, that nothing can interrupt it. So the only thing an operating system guarantees is that this code will be executed sequentially. So we know that this instruction will occur before this instruction and this one will be next. But the code may get executed or get interrupted at any time and some other program run. So we have no guarantee of how long the program will take to execute. The only th guarantee is these will execute these instructions will execute one right after another. There may be other instructions interleaved there running from other applications. 
So let's look at a simple example here of a program that has some shared variable like x, and that's shared between two threads, thread 1 and thread 2. And thread 1 sets x equals to be 1, thread 2 says x is 2. And remember, there's no guarantee how long this takes to execute, and we have no guarantee which executes first. So the question is, what's the value of x after these two threads finish? And the answer is, well, it could be that x is 1. That means that thread 2 executes first and completes, and then thread 1 runs, so x is 1. Or it could be that x is 2. In that case, thread 1 occurred first, and then thread 2 occurred at the end and set x is 2. What about this case? Well, let me do the drawing here. So let's say we're sharing x, a variable, and y, and let's actually instantiate y to be 12. So these are two shared variables. Thread 1 runs and sets x is y plus 1. Thread 2 runs and sets y equals oops, y times 2. Now the question is, well, what's x? What's the value of x? And again, we don't know. There's no guarantee, so we don't know what the value will be. If thread 1 runs first, so it looks up y. y is 12, adds 1 to it, so x is 13. So it could be that x is 13. But suppose thread 2 runs first. y is y times 2, so it's 24. So x is 24 plus 1, so it could be 25. So again, we don't know. There's no guarantee that one will run before the other. The operating system doesn't guarantee this. Finally, let's look at another. Suppose I have as x a shared variable x. It's initially 0. Thread 1 says x equals x plus 1. Thread 2 here, x equals x plus 2. And again, after these run, what's the value of x? And again, there's no guarantee, and it completely depends on how the operating system, where the interruptions occur, and we don't know when they'll occur. We don't program with any knowledge of knowing when they occur. Suppose this one runs, it looks up x, x is 0, and then gets interrupted. As we've seen, this is not an atomic expression, but a series of possibly four machine assembly instructions. So it's 0 and it gets interrupted. Let's say this thread starts executing. x equals x. x is 0. Now we add 2 to it. 2. So we set x equal to be 2. This thread executes again. x was 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. So it could be x at the end of this is 1. It could be that at the end of this x is 2. Or it could be that at the end of this x is 3. So we don't know. We don't know when we execute a set of instructions where it'll get interrupted. What we want to do is protect it. We want to somehow say, this is atomic. Start here. Don't in allow any interruptions until we finish that block. And we'll, in operating systems, be looking at things like semaphores things and f a little fancier things than semaphores to enforce those constraints. Now back to databases. So the same thing is true in Postgres or in any database server where we want to be able to execute some set of statements atomically, meaning that either it's they're all going to work or if one of them doesn't work, we'll roll back all those changes as if none of them happened. This is called transactions, database transactions. So we're going to have a transaction that will be involve multiple statements. Either they're all going to work or if something fails, we'll go back and get rid of them as if none of those statements occurred. So let me show you that. And we've already been doing this. So uh, let me just show you that. 
And I already have a database called Bank. It's a very simplified uh, database. Um, I have one table called Accounts that has a person and an, and an amount. Wait, let me type it. <laughs> there we go. All right, so Ann has $400, Clara has 300 bucks. So let me show you how this works. So I'm gonna begin a transaction. And let's say I'm going to transfer 100 bucks from Clara or from Ann and give it to Clara. So this looks remarkably like that x equals x plus or whatever that I gave you in the C example. And let me give that to Clara. Okay, so here, let me just select it. So here now, Clara has $400, Anne has $300. Let's say something actually went wrong, though, with the transaction. So I can simply go roll back. And you see it's restored to its previous updates, that all those updates I did were rolled back in a way where as didn't occur once I gave this rollback command, so I'm back. So if something happened here, I withdrew 100 bucks from and the servers went down, automatically that rollback would occur. Here I instituted on my own. So when you see rollback or commit in your code, you know that that's what this function is doing, that I can roll back changes or not. So let's do that again. Let's get another 100 bucks, or let's do that same again. So I'm going to take 100 bucks from Anne. I'm going to give it to Clara. Now I am going to commit. And now I'll do that. And you see that that transaction this time actually occurred. So that's the function of these two things. So let me show you one additional fix. For that, let me bring up. So here I have some code, right, that it's going to connect. I'm going to give Anne $100. And here, in order to illustrate this, I'm going to sleep for a minute before I do the commit. Tell her to here it's he's going to take try to get two hundred dollars from Ann. no delay so what i'm going to try to do is as fast as i possibly can try to execute these concurrently i'll first start teller one here i'll execute this one teller two and see if it screws up or actually does a good job so let's give that a shot so teller one teller two and let me get my code up here. And so Anne has 300, Clara has 400. Teller one is going to add 100 to Anne's account. So Anne had 300, now she has 400. Teller two will subtract 200, so it should be 200. That's, yeah. All right. And it'll print the res results. Here it'll print what the result should be. So I'll run that one in the background and then quickly as fast as possible. Execute this one. And you, you, we already can see that something funky is happening. There's no way wait built into teller2.py. There's only a wait for teller1, but yeah, teller2 is waiting. That's because teller1 has a lock on that particular row. When it did that update before the commit, it, it locked that role of the database. Teller2 cannot access that. So we're not going to get into these funky states that I showed you with, when we were playing with the, the C code, where one's trying to add some amount to X and the other is doing some other funky thing. 
So here, maybe I shouldn't have waited a whole minute. Pretty soon that minute will be up. And I'm still waiting for that minute. And there it goes. So tell her two. Clara has says Clara four hundred and Clara has four hundred here. Whoops. I think I just made a mistake in my code. Yes, I did. So let me just go into Postgres instead. Um, So we see Anne is, has the correct amount because of this locking behavior that once we're within some cursor connection or once we're in a connection before we do a commit, if there's some impact on a row, we lock that row and other updates, some other programs can't access it. This is good. So if I have my server and I'm trying to ex, you know, withdraw some money from Anne and at the same time you're running your code that's trying to do something else, we lock that bit of code so we don't get any funky results. So let's talk a little bit about this, acid semantics and base semantics. So this A here stands for atomic. So a sequence of statements that should be a T executes atomically. Or so either they're committed or they're rolled back. So once a connection tries to modify a row, we lock that row. So that's the A of acid. Consistent means that one transaction will move the database from one valid state to another valid state. So if we started the day with having $1,000 on in our accounts, 500 in Anne's account, 500 in Clara's account, and then we moved money from Anne to Clara's account, at the end of the day, we still have 1000 bucks, and we successfully moved that amount. So we still we have this validity that states are valid. We just don't arbitrarily lose money at the end of the day. Also, consistency means that we can have constraints. We can create constraints that there has to be a foreign, the foreign key has to exist, or various other constraints. So that's consistency. The I in ACID stands for isolation. And this means that if I have a database server here, and you're accessing it and adding a hundred dollars and I'm subtracting a hundred dollars we wait even though it looks like we're trying to do this in parallel we serialize this so nothing funky happens just like the example is with the C code that we'd want to somehow prevent the code from executing in parallel with all these funky possibilities so we'll do things to make it look to be more uh, Serial, sorry. And finally, the last thing is durability. So once a transaction has been committed, if there is a power outage, a reboot, a crash, whatever, the data will still be there. So this is very important. We hear this all the time with SQL databases that it has this acid semantics. And that's what all these mean. It's basically the example I gave, the, uh, this atomic one, that we have a group of statements. We want them to be either succeed together, or if something fails, they all get, it's the state of the database as if none of them executed. Consistent means that we haven't lost anything. We're moving from one valid state to another valid state. Isolation means that me subtracting 100 bucks and you adding 100 bucks, nothing's going to get funky. 
Remember that before, if we had a t me executing something and you executing something, initially if x was 200 here, and if I'm adding 100, and you're subtracting 100, remember that we don't know what the results will be. So it, here, this x is 200. I might get interrupted. So remember that this is 200. You execute. x is 200 here. You subtract. That's 100. And now I start executing again. x was 200. So it might be the case that x is 300. Right? It might be the case that x is 100. Or it might be the case that x is 200 depending on how we interweave, do all these interleavings of instructions. This isolation means that we're going to have this transaction occur and then serially this transaction occur. So we won't get into the, any of these funkinesses. Durability is just as it, the word generally means, that once a transaction is committed, that stuff's there in the database regardless of if we crash or something bad happens. So this is really one of the core areas of S benefits of SQL database servers. And because of all this, the nice effects of, or the nice benefits, because of the nice benefits of SQL database servers, including this ans uh, ACID semantics, SQL servers work great. There's a lot of benefits for them. The setup's fairly easy, so Postgres is easy to install. I showed you in a previous, well, it was easy to install in Cloud9. It's easy to install on Amazon or DigitalOcean, wherever you're trying to install it. And as we've been seeing, the programming's not hard. Uh, there's a lot of support, so we just Google stuff for any of these, including Postgres, and we get a lot of information on the web, MySQL included. And it's great for small projects. It's kind of a nearly plug-and-play solution, as we've seen. It's really easy to use. It's ideal for small projects. There's companies out there that really scale vertically S SQL, like there's... Oracle, for example, that make these big database servers here, these big boxes that stand, you know, a man can be yay tall. That's not to scale. A man can be maybe yay tall, and the database servers are these big boxes that they've designed. But it can't grow. The problem with SQL is it can't grow horizontally. So we can't have a lot of these computers in a cluster here all running some SQL and interconnected here with one database among all these machines so this is a problem so it can this horizontal growth this is good getting big iron buying big iron database service from Oracle and it's because of this let me bring up this example there was this paper a while ago in 2000 initially I think this version of the paper might be 2012 somewhere in there this um, famous paper, this Brewer's Conjecture paper, it, this paper proved that had a theorem proving it, is that there are three pro properties that are commonly desired, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And what they argue is that you can have two of these, but you can't have all three. So you can develop servers that have two of these, but you can't have all three of these. So this is a real key, critical paper in this area. And so what SQL servers do, they focus on consist consistency. Right, so we have constraints on foreign keys, constraints in general, ACID semantics, all this, it's really, really great. And remember that we can't have, cons this conjecture is, you you can select on consistency, availability,
and partition tolerance, meaning can we put it on multiple computers in a cluster? And for some web applications, particularly those that have lots and lots of data, think Twitter, think Facebook, maybe this consistency isn't that important as availability. I mean, we want our database to be available. I mean, that seems like we don't want to be going down for maintenance issues or anything. We want it to be available. We want to be able to stick it on multiple computers, have a partition, distribute that database among computers in a cluster. So if we can only have two, maybe this consistency is not the way to go. So we want to shard our data. Shard means just distributed among computers. That's important. Availability, consistency, we can live without. So instead of acid semantics, someone came up with this clever name called base semantics. I suck at writing on this. And this base, this BA part, means basically available. And what it means is when you request data, the data may not actually be there, but you'll get some response. Or it may be inconsistency or in, in a changing state. So it's a lot like, you know, if you just deposit a check, you instantly don't see that check sometimes in your account, but you have to wait a period of time. So you're guaranteed to get some response, but that response may be, we're waiting. The soft state area means that the system can change, this S of is soft state, the system can change over time without any input. If we have multiple machines in a cluster here, and you add 100 bucks here to this person's account, then without any further input, that result may percolate to other machines in the cluster. So for a while, things are changing as these updates are moving about and someone made a change here, and that gets percolated eventually. So it's not an instantaneous update. That's what it means, soft state. Eventually we get to be consistency, but not immediately. And the E stands for eventual consistency. Eventually, sooner or later, things will get consistent, but it's not immediate. So all these solutions that give up acid semantics, go to base semantics, are these ones we're calling no SQL. So no SQL, we're going to give up a little bit on consistency because we want something that'll be on lots of computers and it'll be available all the time. And we can only choose from among th two of these, or we can only choose two of these from among those three. So generally, these NoSQL things, is there's no kind of schemas or no really structured tables. There are tables, but they're not that highly structured ones with specific columns. There's no joins or very limited joins because that takes a lot of processing power. We don't want to, and especially if we have stuff on all of these computers up here, it's hard to do joins when all this data is all distributed like that. Little transactions, so we're not locking. As I just described, we usually lock at least rows. Here we're not going to be doing that because transactions over a cluster of computers, we're not going to be locking like the whole cluster to do something. So that's why there's limited transactions. So let's take a look at some of these great NoSQL systems. So here I'm back to DB engines. This is uh, how I started the class, uh, the first day of class. And we can look at them. There's key value stores. That's, and Redis is the most popular one here as we see. And the key value stores are basically like um, hash tables or dictionaries, things along those lines. I'll talk about that in a separate video. There's document stores. The famous ones are MongoDB, CouchDB. Those are really kind of the big players in this. You can see Mongo has a humongous lead over all others. Document store usually is JSON or binary JSON, Bison. 
And it's th what we've been looking at. The whole structure is this key value pair. So name and whatever. So it's all mm, instruments. And then we might have some list of instruments. So this is always a string. This can be any data type. So that's the document store. And the third kind is what's called a wide column store. So it looks the most like an SQL database. So we have this idea of columns. But the columns can change, the column names change per entry. So we can have Anne here. So her name, Anne, and this could be called instrument, piano. Next entry can be um, last name, Smith, Clara. So we have this idea of columns but the columns don't change name whenever they need to. So here I had name and instrument, and now this, the columns change from last name to first and first name. So that's the wide column store. And Cassandra is the most common wide column store, and that's the one we'll be looking at. So that's it for my quick introduction to NoSQL. So in a nutshell, SQL doesn't play very well. It doesn't work very well when we try to distribute it across a cluster of computers. That's exactly what NoSQL tries to do. It focuses on how can we distribute it horizontally across a cluster of computers and how can we make this data highly available. In the next few videos, we'll be looking at specific NoSQL. We'll be looking at Cassandra, hands-on, how can we get started with it, Redis, super easy to start with, and a bit with MongoDB, which is also a very important one. I hope this video was an interesting one. See you next time.